one of our burdens this year as a church has been that discouragement is a no entry road, that discouragement is not an option. And I felt led to share from Psalm 73 on one of the major reasons I've seen for myself that can lead to discouragement. And the man who wrote Psalm 73 was a really godly man. His name was Asaph. And probably some of, I think some of the most precious verses in the Bible are here uh, in verse, for example, one of them is in verse 25. He says about God, whom, whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. Very uh, beautiful um, uh, attitude that nothing, nothing matters except for the Lord. And if we read the whole Psalm, we can see though that he came to that point after a very deep struggle that tempted him to doubt that God was good. And that struggle of his was what I felt led to share about today. And we'll start just from verses, the first few verses. Verse one and two say, uh, basically it tell, verse two says how deep his struggle was. He said, my feet almost, my, for, as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. And verse one says what they almost slipped from. He said, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. So he's saying God is good to Israel. I see that now, but I almost slipped from that. I almost slipped from seeing that God is from acknowledging that God is good. And the struggle of Asaph was a deep temptation to doubt that God is good because of what's in verse three, for I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And he went on to say um, what he saw in them, these people that don't even love God, basically two things, they have so much and they have it so easy, <laughs> prosperity and no trials. And so Asaph's temptation to discouragement was comparison and envy. And Asaph really struggled with that thought, how and why, if God is good and I'm trying to live before him, why do I struggle so much when these wicked people are prospering? And comparison can be a temptation like that to discouragement and, and envy. If God loves me as much as this other person, why do they have this? Why do they not struggle with that? Um, why can't I have that too? <laughs> and for different people, the temptation can come in different ways. But I think we all need encouragement um, in this area because the devil wants to make us to tempt, he wants to tempt us to doubt God's goodness and deceive us in, in about God's love for us. And I believe this is one of the main ways he does it is by making us look at others who seem to have it better uh, or easier. And so uh, along those lines, I wanted to share four things that encouraged me to um, help me with that temptation to compare myself with others and to be content with my lot, uh, contentment with what the Lord's given me. And the first thing was don't focus on what you don't have. Appreciate what you do have. And I believe this is the Bible's main encouragement that the Lord gives me uh, is to be, to be content and to stop comparing was to, to appreciate what I do have. And in verse 22, he talks about how I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. But the Lord started, so he was like an animal, not seeing things so clearly, but the Lord started showing Asaph, Asaph all that he had in him. In verse 23, he said, nevertheless, I'm continually with you. In verse 24, he said, you'll guide me and afterward receive me to glory. And Asaph had that this whole time, but he missed it. Uh, he, he, it's along the lines of Hebrews 13, 5, that says that we've heard many times, the reason we can be content and not always constantly looking down and discouraged by what we don't have is because God's with us. He'll never desert us or forsake us. And despite of what the devil wants us to think, God's love for us is never marked by what our outward circumstances look like. As much as it feels like it is, your and my happiness isn't tied to what we have or don't have. We have to be done with that mindset. Psalm 1611 says that it's tied only to one thing, and that's the reality of God's presence in our life. Our joy is only tied to that one thing, the reality of God's presence in our life. That's it. Not what we do or don't have. In your presence is fullness of joy. 
So that's really helped me uh, remembering the things that were tempted to compare ourselves uh, and envy people over. They're not the things that last. Our names are written in heaven. Everything else is passing. And what we have today is God's presence. We can have that right now. And uh, that's the, I believe that's the main thing, the main encouragement the Bible gives. The, a, a, a lottery ticket winner um, that just won $3 million or something doesn't get upset if he gets a parking ticket while he's picking up his winnings because he's gained something a lot bigger than a little parking ticket loss. <laughs> and it, when you have a, a big win, uh, small losses are much easier to bear. And so that's, I believe that's what God's argument is. Look what you have in Christ. Uh, and so all the passing things here um, are much easier to bear when we see what we have. And it's even, I mean, I mean, that's the spiritual aspect and God's presence, the primary thing, but it's even helped me to remember even the earthly things that God's given me on this earth. I can and should uh, appreciate and enjoy them freely without guilt uh, and with gratitude. First Timothy six seventeen says that God richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. First Timothy 4, 4 says that everything created by God is good and nothing's to be rejected if it's received with gratitude. So to be thankful and enjoy what I do have, uh, enjoying what I do have has helped me to stop focusing my mind on the idea of more and more and more. I, I remember I was, I struggled for a, a while with the idea of having, uh, being on the road a couple hours a day um, on, for, with my commute to work. And one day I just surrendered it to the Lord and said, okay, Lord, I guess you just, maybe you just want this for me. Maybe this is your will. I accept it, Lord, I praise you. And so I started using the time, uh, embrace the commute I, I, where I could, I could talk to God. I can listen to messages or songs, call people. I'd take advantage of it. And I really started enjoying it. And it became a really precious time. And God turned something that was a burden into a good gift. Um, and, but if I had stayed focused on how can I get out of this? How can I get out of here? Uh, I need a new job, no commute. I would have missed it. Uh, but I, I believe it's God's will for us to enjoy our life, um, him first, wherever we're at today, without this mind of more and more something different. Um, the, the, the plain and simple things he's given us without the idea of more and more. Maybe you don't have the money for a big vacation, but you enjoy sitting down with your spouse for coffee at night. So go freely enjoy that as much as you want. Uh, Proverbs 5.18 says, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. You're obeying the Bible, <laughs> um, not to not to idolize what um, what God's given me on this earth, but at the same time to to enjoy it as a good gift, and not have our minds focused on something else that who knows if we'll never have. I remember reading a, a story one time about some king or emperor who was trying to conquer all the kingdoms around him and overtake the whole land. And after one of his victories, one of his servants came to him and said, sir, what, what will you do next? And he said, well, let's go get this territory. Uh, and the servant kept pressing him saying, okay, and then what? And he said, well, let's go get this, we'll go get this other one after. And he kept going on and on. He said, well, what happens when you conquer everything? All these kingdoms and the whole world is yours. What will you do then? And the emperor said, then I'm going to sit back and relax and enjoy life. And the servant said to him, but sir, can't we do that now already? <laughs> and, and we can be so focused on getting more and more and more that we miss what the Lord's given us right now. And so it's been freeing to me to, to surrender that idea of more and to enjoy what he's given without being fixed on the next thing, chasing some thing that may or may never come. Uh, Cause I can fully enjoy what he's given to me today because I can do it in fellowship with him. Like Asaph said, the nearness of God is my good. That's the main thing. Um, he's with us. And that, um, that's a reason to rejoice. And another thing, uh, the second thing that's helped me with temptations to compare and to be content is uh, recognizing that the reason my, why my life looks like it does and it doesn't look like somebody else's is because God's plan is very specific and it's just for me. It's the, and it's the best plan for me, the best eternal plan for me. And uh, in, verse, in Psalm 73, verse uh, you could see that, I think, in verse in verses 17 um, and also. So in 17, it says, I came to the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. 
So he started looking further down the road at a bigger picture. And then in 24, he said, with your counsel, you will guide me. And afterward, you'll receive me to glory. So Asaph started looking not just at the moment, but God's big, bigger plan, his eternal plan. And that, that was a release for him. And recognizing if God rearranged my life to look like someone else's, then it wouldn't be his best plan for me. There'd be a, a lot of eternal loss that would come along with it. Psalms 139, 16 talks about, uh, I think we could talk about God's blueprint for our life. Psalm 139, verse 16 says, your eyes have seen my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. So God already wrote about um, today and he wrote about tomorrow and every single day of my life, there's a blueprint and a plan that God has. And if we love him with all our heart and we make our goal to be like Jesus and put him first, then he can fulfill that plan. But he can't fulfill that plan if our main goal is to kick and fight and change the blueprint. Um, if, we kick, if we keep fighting him for that, we might succeed in changing the blueprint. But that's a pretty scary thing. <laughs> we might to satisfy some temporary desire, uh, but we won't get his best. We'll definitely miss out eternally on something. And so I've gotten a lot of peace out of the fact that I can work hard to better my and my family's situation for sure. We should definitely work hard to get educated and make a good career. Um, it's a good. It's a good thing. But if but if it becomes clear that I'm kicking down a door that God's closed or that I don't have rest in my heart, then I have to let it go and abandon it. And when we do that, the confirmation that God will give us that we're on the right track now, back on the right track, is that the peace will come back to our heart. And I, I've seen that many times. And um, But we may think that, well, why can't I follow God and have this too? <laughs> uh, can't, he, can't he change my boundary and still fulfill his plan? Um, and that can be a, a hard question, but I realized that uh, we've been hearing about how weak we are, how, how we're zeros, we're like infants. We have to recognize we're really, really weak. And if the Lord changed our boundaries to fit our desires, that, that he, the boundaries he put around us for our good, we would definitely ruin the plan. Uh, we would ruin ourselves and maybe even other people around us, like our kids or something. Every detail of the plan of our life has to be in God's hands and best thing we can do for ourselves to, to see that that's our best and surrender. It's the best thing for us. It's the best thing for our families and for those in our, our life for God to use us. Um, and it's like we heard last week, we're just infants. We don't even know what's coming tomorrow, let alone five or 10 years from now. How can we know what's, what's a good thing? Um, it's better than trying to predict everything and go along that course than to, to it, the best thing is to ask the Lord which direction to go and then go that way and submit to it and and say, Lord, I don't know anything. Uh, you make the decisions for my life, what I have or I don't have. I'll embrace the closed doors and I have you and that's enough. And and I believe that's the point that Asaph got to and uh, where he got that peace and rest. And I think that can be our peace too. And then the, the next thing on my heart that helped me is the to keep on surrendering to, to it. Uh, I think Asaph found his release through surrender. And confessing that my only hope now is in God's nearness. I surrender everything else. It seemed like he hoped in a lot of things. I want prosperity like, like these guys. I, uh, I want ease like these guys. But, he's, but he came to the point of verse 28. The nearness of God is my good, my only good. Um, I've made the Lord my refuge. So he decided his refuge wasn't going to be what he wanted before. Um, it was only, his only good was, it said he made the Lord his refuge. So to, to make that conscious decision by God's grace to say, uh, I resign myself from every other ambition. Uh, I, it's, it may still be in our feelings and that's okay. We can't control our feelings, but in our will, it's an act of the will to, to say, Lord, by your grace today, right now, I want to make the decision to surrender everything else, um, to give up every intention to ever take it up again. Like, like Abraham, he didn't, he didn't go up to the mountain thinking, well, maybe God won't make me sacrifice Isaac. He was ready to do it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and uh, so when doing that consistently, when the temptation comes, that's really helped free me and helped me. And I have to nail to the cross every time the question of why can't I have that too? 
that can be a really deep, hard question. Why can't I have that too? But we have to nail it to the cross and say, what is, what is the Lord's will for me? And um, Asaph may have prayed uh, a deep prayer of surrender, kind of like Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane, Lord, your will be done. Um, excel everyone else around me. You can keep me in exactly this hard position by your grace. I'll still rejoice. I don't need anything else. Not one more penny on my salary. I don't need other people to treat me right or to notice me. I don't need my problems to go away. By your grace, I'll still choose to rejoice. You're my good now. And so when I found the most peace comes when I totally surrender to God like that. Uh, it's a, a, a surrendered life is a very relaxed life. <laughs> it's a really, really freeing when we can let go of all expectations uh, outside of God himself. Um, and it's a, it can be a struggle. Sometimes we, we can be in it and we start falling into that, but <clears throat> to be consistent in it. And um, it, the Bible says that God's power is perfected in our weakness. So that means when we're dead, when we totally surrendered, that's when God's strength can be effective in our life. But uh, one, just one thing on that, though, that I've seen is that we can get victory in a surrender like that in a moment, having so much peace come. But then two days later or two weeks later, the temptation can come back. Uh, there's a lot of times I'd see myself come to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, your will be done. And I'd find such a freedom, like uh, so much joy. Uh, but then I'd be surprised a few weeks later when the temptation comes up back so strong again, and I get discouraged because I thought I was past it. <laughs> Lord, why, why am I struggling with this again? I thought I overcame this. <laughs> uh, but I saw that it doesn't mean we didn't get victory. Uh, it just means that we have to fight again. We got victory for the day. It was one, it was one battle. It's a, Jesus said it's a daily cross. It's not a one-time cross. And, um, and even after Jesus overcame Satan in the wilderness, You'd think, wow, Jesus was an overcomer. But it said the Satan left him until an opportune time. That means Satan came back again. So I saw that I need to keep going to the Lord for grace and not get discouraged when it comes back. Um, but to be ready for it, say this is the way out, to lean on the Lord, to surrender again afresh and um, not say, what did I do wrong? But uh, Luke 18, 1, Jesus said, we should always pray and not, not lose heart. So our, our overcoming depends on us not losing heart. And then the, the last thing, that was on my heart that I wanted to uh, share that helps me, that has helped me overcome comparison um, in the times when I, I really struggled with it was to recognize how much of a lack of love there is towards others in envy uh, and comparison. And I don't see this specific point in Psalm 73 with Asaph, uh, but I see it really clearly in 1 Corinthians 13 verse four that says, the, the first two points are love is patient, love is kind. But then the first, the next point, the number three is love is not jealous. And so uh, that's one of the main characteristics of love, that it can root for another person. Not, not many people have the grace uh, to be able to be happy for someone else when that person gets something better than them. And uh, if you imagine uh, someone's at the Olympics in a race and they're in first place and they're about to take the gold medal and they're almost at the finish line. And then someone else at the last second flies past them and takes first place. How can the, the first one, how can the one, the one who got passed and got second place be happy? Is it possible? <laughs> and at first it seems like there's no way, how can they be happy about that? But I can think of one person who would be really happy if, um, if the person who got passed happened to be the father of the one who got first place then that person, the person who got second would be so happy to not get first place because why is it? It's because of love. Uh, parents love their children with such a pure love that they rejoice if their son or daughter does better than them because there's no comparison there because love is there. Love is not envious. So uh, pure love like God, like that, it's, it always rejoices in someone else's good. And that's how God's love is. And so I see that's how my love should be. I want my love to be like that. And um, and that spoke a challenging word to me, which I've had to repent of a lot of times. That is, if, if I find envy in myself, I have to recognize it's because my love for this person is so little. Whoever I'm envying, uh, it's so lacking. Lord, help me to love this person better. Real love immediately drives out envy. If I'm envious, there's something lacking in my love there for the other person. And Romans 5.5 5 says that if I can be filled with the Holy Spirit, then I can have his pure love in my heart 
for somebody else. And that will help me to be done with comparison and to genuinely be happy uh, for other people and content with my lot um, without comparing. And so, so I just uh, wanted to end by saying that God has a plan and a purpose for why our lives look exactly like they do and not like somebody else's and his love for us and his favor is never proved by our circumstances or disproved by our trials. We have to be totally done with that mindset so we don't get discouraged. Um, and uh, Romans 6.14 is uh, very true that envy and comparison don't have to be master over us, but we don't have to be slaves to them. The, the Lord has a victory for us. He can help us to be totally content people. Um, and like the victory he gave Asaph when he opened his eyes, he can give us the same. May the Lord help us to keep overcoming this temptation as it comes uh, to us in different ways for each of us and uh, to rejoice in him all the time because of what we already have in Jesus.